Hi, everybody, and welcome to The Ethics of Now from Home, our attempt here at the Keenan Institute for Ethics to work together with each other, but also with y'all out in the audience to think through and talk through some of the more vexing ethical dilemmas of our, um, of our moment. Today, we're going to take up one of these many um, naughty issues. We are going to be talking about opportunities and, and, and inequities, education in a pandemic. We're going to follow the same format that we have in previous iterations of this discussion. I will be talking with our guests for roughly 40 minutes. We'll stop at 740 and we will turn to your questions. You'll notice that the chat function is disabled. We ask that you submit your questions via the Q&A function, and we will try to get to as many of them as time allows. When I say we, I don't just mean me, I mean the army of folks from Keenan who are hidden behind the scenes, who are helping make this possible. They're also here in case there are um, technical problems or odd surprises, and those have happened over the past several weeks. I also say we because this week, unlike in previous weeks, I have multiple guests. So this is going to be fun. It'll be a bigger conversation. I think it'll be an animated conversation. I'm certain it'll be an important conversation. But those guests today um, include three people. The first is David Malone. He is professor of the practice in education at Duke and teaches for Keenan's What's Now, What Now Network. He teaches courses in educational psychology, literacy, and service learning. Working closely with Duke, with colleagues in Duke and in the Durham Public Schools, he helped develop a service learning tutoring program that matches about 300 Duke students each year with students who need assistance in reading, math, and academic learning strategies. He's interested in the psychology of holistic student development um, and creating just and ethical enabling conditions that will foster within K through 16 educational settings, the full development of human potential. That is a small ambition, my friend. Um, Brian McDonald is a social studies teacher at Jordan High School and instructor of education in Duke's program in education, along with teaching AP government and politics, multicultural studies, and American history founding principles, civics and economics. He also created and teaches an elective course for Durham Public Schools on poverty in America. At Duke, he teaches teaching high school and secondary school issues, pedagogy, content, and methods, and su supervises and coordinates student teachers. He's the author of Not the End, But the Beginning, The Impact of Race and Class on the History of Jordan High School, 1963 to 1988. And then we have as well, Bethlehem Fareed. She is a Duke undergraduate student and B in Duke scholar. She's a Durham resident, and while a student at Jordan High, she was a student activist and organized many events that pushed the school to re-examine educational equity and ethical development. She currently works at a local nonprofit made in Durham as a youth organizing coordinator, is on the board for the Reintegration Support Network, and is involved in campus advocacy through groups such as Duke's NAACP chapter. So welcome y'all and thank you for being part of this conversation. I'm glad to have you here. Thank you for having thank me. Thank you. Um, so we could ask, we could have, this conversation could have begun a million different ways. It could go in a million um, different directions. I'm going to start with one route in and we'll see where that path takes us. Um, and I'm gonna start with this one, this question that I've asked about various topics that we've covered over the course of this webinar, but that I think about a lot in terms of schools um, being locked at home with my two elementary schoolers for the past three months. And that are, so what are some of the issues that aren't new necessarily, but that the COVID pandemic and our necessary reactions to it have made hyper visible? And maybe I'll start with you, Brian, and then you guys can jump in as the spirit moves you. Sure. I, I, you know, it, 
None of it is new, as you mentioned, right? But some of the issues that we're reminded of more than anything else is access, what students have access to, what technology exists, what inequities exist with regards to not only computers, but internet access, uh, transportation, um, food insecurity, right? For a lot of students, 48% of the students at Jordan are on free and reduced lunch. So for a lot of students in the district and at our school, uh, the school is a, is a hub and is a center for a lot of different support, including food, um, health care, and health care inequities. And so, you know, most folks in the field of education, most students, uh, and I think more folks now realize what a lot of us have already known for a long time is inequities and in access to technology, health care, and food um, have been highlighted over the last four months. I'm going to say this came up in our last conversation too, where I'm talking about well-being for children and families with Anna Gaspin Pines last week, where it immediately struck me. I was moved and impressed by the way that DPS and the DPS Foundation jumped up to make sure that kids got fed. I also find it slightly insane that we're relying on schools to make sure that people aren't hungry. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So other, other folks or thoughts about this? Yeah, um, I think just to add to that, I think um, in addition to the issues of accessibility, which I think are very clear and like Mr. McDonald had a really good answer for that. But I think to add to that, it's the really, at least what seems to me a very impractical and possibly lazy and careless ways in which a lot of money is spent in public schools. So as far as like per pupil expenditure, I think um, in Durham Public Schools, it's around like $11,000, which is on the higher side compared to um, other districts in North Carolina. Um, but specifically the amount of money that's going into things that only really help us very specialized group of students, uh, like AP coursework or SROs and things like that, um, which since they only serve a particular demographic, we see like these investments don't actually, that didn't help us when a lot of really vulnerable students um, were kind of fell victim to um, this kind of like careless spending when it came to the pandemic because now they were left with practically nothing. Um, and I think um, COVID definitely highlighted this because like it was now we were kind of forced to see it if we didn't already see it. Um, and I think if we were spending the money the way it should have been uh, to serve under-resourced students, perhaps that maybe the other accessibility issues we see now that Mr. McDonald talked about wouldn't be so aggressive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've been thinking a lot about the function that schools play and they do a lot more than deliver knowledge and skills. They serve as cornerstones of communities. And the notion of community schools is something that uh, folks have been looking at in Durham and I think it's something we need to provide more resources for. Another thing that struck me as a teacher, as a professor, is that I kept getting these papers from students in which uh, they would put the word exposed in quotes, like the virus has exposed uh, inequities in education, but the word exposed would always be in quote, which made me begin to realize that they weren't really exposed. They always existed. They just was heightened awareness of them now. And it also struck me the, how quickly we could do away with some things that we at one time thought were so fundamental to education, like end of grade tw test or end of course test, or even the grading system, or at Duke just today, um, the announcement that we will suspend use of the SAT and the ACT. So these things that we thought were like fundamental requirements of having an education system with a flick of a pen are just gone. So it makes you want to re-examine the entire system. I will say I keep getting emails about how to access my children's report card. And I think of all of the things that I'm worried about in the world right now, the grade that my children got for um, trying to figure out how to follow their work slides is not the thing that I'm, that I'm fixating on. It's like, 
I'm spending time with them. I can see that they're, they're learning something. And the miraculous thing actually was that they, that they were. I mean, I think the other piece of this conversation is realizing like how ridiculously much we rely on teachers and all of the extras, right? But then also to teach in completely untenable circumstances. Mm-hmm. I think that the stu- my kids' teachers were far more dedicated to carrying out their educational mission, or maybe I shouldn't say dedicated, far more effective at carrying out their educational mis- mission than I think I was this mm-hmm. semester. Mm-hmm. Ryan, how about you as a teacher? What was that like? <laughs> what was it like being an elementary school teacher? It was miserable. Um, <laughs> I have a five-year-old and an eight-year-old here at the house, and uh, we live in Orange County. I was very pleased with um, Orange County's efforts, more, more pleased with Orange County's efforts than I was with Durham's. Um, but it was, it was still a challenge. I mean, the teachers worked extremely hard uh, to try to maintain some level of consistent instruction. Uh, and I, I knew full well that some of my son's peers did not have access, did not attend the Zoom meetings, were not doing the same things that we were doing. Um, and, and I was adding to it here at the house, which my son hated. Um, my son frequently said he couldn't wait to go back to school because the teachers there were a lot nicer. So, uh, you know, the, those were the challenges that I was facing over the last three months. Yeah, but you also had to be teaching high school. Right. So, but, but same thing. You know, I didn't have 100% participation. I had, to Beth Lim's point earlier, I had the students with access, the students with motivation, and the students with um, the resources make time to come to class. And as the semester wore on, fewer and fewer students um, were able to meet those commitments. And motivation is, a, is an interesting word to use. Do you want to talk about that a little bit more? Which word? <laughs> Motivation. Motivation, she said. No, I, th- I think there were different levels. I, I, I had a number of students um, who had access um, and who had uh, family members that reached out to me to ask what we were doing. Um, and they, uh, and I think about my AP class in particular, as we were preparing for the AP exam, which they still had. Um, and so we had a number of students with access um, and with the time and not with the health challenges or the hunger challenges um, that still did not make, um, make the time or make the effort. I mean, so there's something to be said for that opportunity of face-to-face instruction with regards to motivation and enthusiasm for all levels of students, my son included in the second grade. He was much more motivated by his teacher who he adored than me telling him he had to do multiplication tables. Um, so it, it was an issue across the board as well. So Bethlehem, when you asked that question, were you thinking about the difference between motivation and say bandwidth or like that one could want to, but just not be, not have the circumstances surrounding them where they're able to? Um, yeah, that's basically kind of what I was coming for, I think. Um, I just think the word motivation is like very tricky to use in circumstances like this. I think Mr. McDonald's reasoning, like like that made sense to me, but like um, sometimes hearing it from other people is a little bit jarring because like it is really hard to fully understand the circumstances of people yeah. that we may not see every day, um, especially during a circumstance like this where a lot of people, even if originally their circumstances were very like, um, were, they were like relatively accessible, um, to resources that that could have changed very dramatically in the span of a couple of weeks. Um, so that's kind of what I had in mind, but I think Mr. McDonald's response was good, so. Yeah, that, may, that kind of makes me think about, one of the things I talk um, to Duke students about is where are we placing the locus of responsibility for the challenges that certain children are facing in school? And oftentimes, my students at Duke, um, their first reaction is to place it on the individual. So they might say they're not motivated. Uh, Education isn't important to them. And 
I guess it's my responsibility to do sort of a root cause analysis with them and, and think about all the dis different explanations that we might have for uh, where the responsibility lies. And it's sort of like the p policing now. I mean, you can have sort of the um, bad apple model of, oh, we just don't have good school administrators or good teachers, or you could have the model where you place the responsibility on an individual or a subculture. And it's difficult for students to start thinking about uh, more systemic patterns of why these, these challenges exist. So I, I was kind of thinking that, Bethlehem, when you were questioning the use of the word motivation, because sometimes I find it to be a kind of a coded word. So what are the, I mean, we've named issues, right? We've named food security, which I think is a huge one. Healthcare, right, as an issue. At a moment, I don't know what's happening in other public schools, but when my children started elementary school, there was a nurse in their school and now there is not. I don't know how we go back to um, in-person classes without a nurse or some kind of very serious healthcare worker in every school all day long, right? Um, but if you were to start extracting, here are things that are tremendously necessary, but where the responsibility should lie outside of the school system itself. What are some of those things in our social safety net or in the things, the net of things that we have to support children? Do you think I've been, or do you, am I wrong that there are things that are misplaced as the responsibility of schools? I mean, I think um, that's a really interesting question because I think now schools are kind of a place where students are getting a lot of different types um, of specialized care, not to the extent that they need it, but it is. Um, and I think until there is like a very dramatic change in like the way our government treats social services, then I think that schools do need to be the place where students are getting certain things, especially when it comes to health care, um, dental care, which some, I know some elementary schools do that more than like middle or high schools. Um, anything like that, because at this point, I don't think there's any issue that schools shouldn't tackle just because the infrastructure outside of schools is really so weak and like, I think also routinely fail students. Um, but I think the sheer accessibility of public schools warrants that, um, that it, have, it has the resources to give students what they need. At least is my first reaction to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with that. I think until the resources exist to the degree that they need to, schools become, you know, the, the outlet for all of those resources. I was saying at Bethlehem and David earlier this week, I, my, at the same time, my biggest frustration to that is that public schools, the way they are set up, are reactive institutions. We are reactive institutions. It's my largest frustration. I've been in public education for 20 years, and the fact that we we are not proactive, we are reactive. You know, we realize that, um, you know, the, the pandemic has created mental health challenges for students that we are totally unaccustomed to deal with because we haven't thought about it before. And so in a reactive approach, now we become aware of the resources that can help our students. Um, with regards to struggling grades, for example, um, DPS has a policy that says the lowest grade you can get is a 50 for the first three quarters of our school. Instead of what can we do at the very beginning to make sure that that doesn't happen? Um, you know, so and that's true with regards to test preparation, with regards to the paths that students are on in our schools, with regards to um, food insecurity. You know, we find out after the fact and we try to solve these problems after the fact. So I agree with Bethlehem that we have become the hub because others can't or aren't doing it effectively. And I think we're doing a disservice to students because we are reacting instead of creating a proactive approach uh, to, the students that, to the students that need resources, educational and otherwise. You know, one thing I've been thinking a lot about, and I'd like to get y'all's thoughts on it, is whether or not we can really fix the schools 
I mean, in my early days, I, I'm older. In my early days, I was sort of like, oh, we need some reforms. But the more I read about and watch TV uh, and hear people speak about, say, the policing situation and the notion of sort of abolition of the police or defunding the police, to me, like, I just find all these analogs to schooling. Like, it, it's, um, it's not something that we can just tweak or reform. I think, and, 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 and to Adrian's question, I think we need to mo move more towards a model of community school than away from that. And we need to think more about reimagining the entire school model because the students that come into my class, they, one of the first things they say is, oh, the schools are broken and we have to fix them. And there's an argument that, well, maybe the schools aren't broken. Maybe they are working exactly as they are designed to reproduce and perpetuate the existing social order. And sometimes when I say that in my classes, the students will say, oh, you're, you're espousing conspiracy theories. And if I'm lucky and I have two or three students that are willing to stand up and say, well, it's not really a conspiracy theory because that's reality. So I'm thinking about in the last few years about just reimagining the whole notion of schooling. And that's gonna be a tremendous undertaking because like policing, it's a institutionalized system that serves a purpose. So the way that I would come at that question is to say that my counter argument to schools are broken is baby schools aren't broken, society is broken. Right. Right? That what you see are schools reflective of the structures that we have put in place and elsewhere. And if you want schools to be different, then you're going to have to make everything different around them. But I have a follow-up question for you, David. If we imagine community schools as one of our answers, one, how do we deal with integration? Again, in a society in which um, residential segregation is pervasive and the language of property rights will shut down attempts to, to rethink that. And then as a question about my question, is integration the goal, right? I, I say this, I just assigned to the Masters of Arts at Teaching Students Russell Rickford's We Are an African People about Pan-Africanist sort of utopian, not utopian, but Pan-Africanist schools in the 1970s, right? Um, where I asked this question about integration, but I have imagined one of them in my head being like, what is that serving, right? So two questions, community schools, how do you do integration? Am I like a vestigial, like, Sesame Street kid, where I'm still trying to push for integration when people have moved to thinking about other kinds of things. Right. Does one of y'all want to, you want me to, I don't want to keep talking. Does someone want to jump in? I can offer some thoughts. Okay. I would simply say we're not, we're not integrated now. I'm sorry, Bethlehem. I, yeah, I would go ahead. We're not integrated now. I mean, in, in, in schools like in, in Durham Public Schools, schools like Southern and Hillside, 85, 90% African American. Um, schools the entire like public York, Durham, Durham schools is um, what, 19% white? Correct. But, but even schools like Jordan that pride themselves, as I think they should, on a diverse student body, the numbers look good, but the hallways don't, the classes don't. So I'm not sure, you know, it's a fair question, but I'm not sure we're integrated now as, as an institution. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. I, mean, I don't think I have anything to add to that specific point. Um, I do agree that things um, aren't necessarily integrated now. Um, and I think the idea of community schools is is something to definitely entertain and think about, but um, the implementation of that is also that can that can easily facilitate a lot more inequities than like we're facing right now. And it's not something I necessarily have the most expertise on, 
um, even though like abolition is a very big part of my politics, like I think comparing um, schools and like police is a very like dangerous comparison just because I think the, even though I think schools are a very, can be a very harmful source and it's like one of the major perpetrators of white supremacy in our society, I think that like a good school can do a lot more for a student, whereas there's no such thing as like a good police department. So I think just try, I think there are better comparisons to make in that regard. Um, so those are kind of my thoughts there. Well, I'm not, I'm not using com the term community school to mean a neighborhood school. I'm using it to, to represent a, a building and a place where community resources are available to everyone. Like, like we were talking about, like dental care, health care, food, um, a sense of community, recreation. So. In some ways that is actually more in line with the utopian black power vision of we are the, like the schools that come out of we are African people. Um, so, what does a good school, what does a good school look like? And I say that thinking about the proposals that like Bethlehem that you came out the gate with, we're gonna get rid of AP courses. I'm on board with, I hate, I have hated testing since I had to write an essay in high school and for some standardized test and made the essay how this essay was a waste of my time, right? And it's only sort of grown since then the amount of testing that we do but if we have no testing i'm you know indifferent to grades we we don't have ap courses i guess we're not going to have ib courses so what is the measure like how do we know when schools are working how do we know when students are learning in this in this big hippie utopian proposal that we just brought forward um, yeah so I, I think i can start with that question um i think you can tell if a school is working if a student actually wants to go to school. I think um, a lot of times, I think the sentiment of like, the sentiment of like American students of like dreading school, that isn't necessarily like a global commonplace, which is like something I kind of like grew to understand. And like American students have a very unique sense of disdain towards their academic institutions. And like, I think when students see their schools as a place of growth and like educational attainment and not, oh, this grade or um, like getting this recommendation. And I think that's one step. Uh, when students are actually healthy, that's one step. If students aren't being policed, their bodies aren't being policed or their behaviors aren't being policed in certain ways, I think that's also a step. Um, it's hard to say because I think the types of schools that like I'm imagining now, like haven't really been put into practice in a wide scale. So I, I am afraid to say that like, oh, this specific thing will work perfectly. Um, but what I do know for sure is like what is happening now is only pushing students away and it's pushing away um, the most like marginalized and vulnerable people. Um, so that's kind of what I have on that, but I'm sure after Dr. Malone says something, I'll probably have something to add. <laughs> well, I'm thinking like what schools need not to be. So they, for example, like instead of um, cops in school, we need more counselors in school. Instead of criminalizing, as you said, Bethlehem, student behavior, we need to think about more restorative justice approaches. So I think in terms of, I like the question like, how do we measure um, how good a school is? And I liked your answer, Bethlehem. I love that, that if, if kids want to go there, if they, if they feel like they're thriving and flourishing there, uh, if it's a welcoming place, if um, it's not just a diverse place, but it's a place in which um, they feel that their voice is heard um, and that they're counted. And it's also a place that, um, you know, uh, James Baldwin uh, wrote an essay called um, Talk with Teachers, in which, and this has to do with history, uh, and Adrian as a history professor, he says that most of our work 
uh, that teachers need to do is a reckoning with history. So in my sense, um, it all starts with teaching the truth. And right now, I don't think we're teaching the truth. And I think our students recognize that it lacks, um, it doesn't ring true in their ears. And uh, when we begin to teach the truth and begin where students are, I think they will feel more fully connected to the school experience. Yeah, and I think something you said um, about like a good school isn't necessarily just a diverse one. I think that's really important. Um, something that like Angela Davis and a lot of like really amazing like black communists have said is like diversity is a corporate strategy, right? So like diversity in and of itself like doesn't really do much for anyone as um, well, I, I mean, it's the appeal of it, I guess, can seem nice. But other than that, like there isn't really intrinsic value unless like other things are matched. And I think like even with Jordan, like Mr. McDonald was talking about earlier, like Jordan based value, right? It's like a super diverse school. It has like a lot of students from a lot of different places, which sounds great. But then like from my personal experience, like I may not even see someone, I don't have to see someone of a different race if my classes are like assigned in a particular way, right? So like um, there are plenty, I mean, students are segregated very easily within schools. So I think that goes to show how diversity is a corporate strategy because like you see externally, but internally it's just as bad as you would go, as it would be in a school that has no diversity. Um, so I think that's a really important thing to consider. And it's a, another reason why I think AP classes should just not exist. I mean, like, I think it, the idea of like pushing, um, ad, like advocating for students of color, specifically black and brown students to take these higher level classes is great. But then there's certain things that you need to be successful in these higher, like higher level classes that a lot of these students may not have. So I think you're doing a lot of students a disservice by pushing them into these classes when you can't guarantee that the resources they need to be successful will be given to them. So I think that's a really, so it's not that I don't want black students to be academically challenged, right? But I just don't think that AP class will necessarily do that. And I'm speaking from experience with my friends at school um, when I was in high school. So those are kind of some of my ideas based on what Dr. Malone just said. But I'm sure Mr. Rudolph has something to say because he doesn't agree with me on this, but. I was gonna ask Brian, should we scrap AP classes? No. No, nope, not at all. Um, I, I think, and I know Bethel and I just, and I love Bethel. And I, she was one of the best students I've ever had in 20 years. Um, I, I mean, the, I, we've talked for 50 years about burning schools to the ground and, and starting over again. I mean, that's a, that's a great talking point for radically changing schools. <laughs> Arson is not a great talking point. No, I'm kidding. What's that? No, I don't mean, I don't mean it that way, but I, I mean, we've had these conversations. Right? For decades, we've had these conversations, and what we haven't had is a lot of action. And I think you can, I don't want to use the arson analogy again, but, you know, I, I think you can light a fire within the building and change how things are done. Right? I'm also biased, and I recognize that on so many levels, from race to, I'm also the department chair of our advanced placement program at our school. So I, I come in with that perspective. Um, I, I think to Bethlehem's point, I think we need to provide the skills. I think our job is to provide the skills. Let's revamp education so that it is content in the context of skills. Let's revamp education and eliminate what we call academic level courses or what other schools call standard level courses. But the only courses we offer are honors and AP. Let's eliminate the stigma that you are in a lower level course and actually teach all classes like they have students in them that are capable of doing amazing things. Because what we have right now is a culture and a mindset among staff that, oh, I have this class, or I have to deal with this class, and every stereotype that comes with that class. I had a conversation with a teacher at the beginning of the year, uh, last year, in the library making small talk. And I said, well, what are you teaching this year? And they gave the name of the course, and I went, oh, and my response to that was about content because I'm terrible at that content. And that teacher looked at me and said, no, 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 I have good kids too. 
I wasn't, I wasn't talking about the students. I was talking about the painful content that I'm not very good at. And that teacher was talking about students. So I think the culture needs to be changed. I think we're capable of that. I think we have to let students know that they're capable of being successful and treat students like they're being successful. Um, and the mindset of staff, not just at our building, but in schools across the country, I'm sure, are reflective of we are coming in with the wrong mindset. And I, I, Bethlehem knows that I'm guilty of that at times as well. Um, but the challenge is not doing that. Well, Brian, uh, we had a little practice session on Tuesday, the three of us, and we got kind of energized and upset about this point in terms of whether we can reform the schools or we need just to reimagine and rethink them. I, I'm actually with uh, Bethlehem. I, I don't think AP courses serve a purpose anymore other than protecting certain um, privileges of those that are in them and the, and the power of those that are in them and to, and to reproduce a certain part of, of society. So I like what you said, Brian, about we should be teaching all courses like um, gifted and AP courses, you know. So to me, the notion of um, inequity being a, a shape shifter is um, very true. And so say tracking or this notion that there are different levels within schools, to me, it's just a, a way in which um, racism and inequity has shifted shapes. And we, we have to be careful that it, even if we get with a, rid of um, tracking, that it will shift shapes into another form, this idea of, of inequity being. So when I say um, we need to rethink and reimagine schooling, I agree with you, Brian, about the mindset, but that's part of the system and how we recruit, select, train, orient, provide professional development for teachers. All that's baked in. It's embedded. Right. And these aren't tweaks. These are recalibrating, um, rethinking. So. so we are close to the end of our discussion time and about to about to move to q and A. I'm going to put a pin in school resource officers because we actually haven't talked about policing in schools fully. And I would like that to be a conversation that we have. So somebody in the audience, ask a question about school resource officers so we can talk about it. Um, or a, about other things instead of school to prison pipeline. But I wanted to ask about possibility too, because that I think was in the title of our of our conversation and kind of close out our conversation part of this by asking if there are, I mean, in the midst of the terrible, terrible series of failures and disappointments that is the national and, to, and I think actually to a lesser extent, but to some extent, the local response to the COVID pandemic, are there opportunities as we're all trying to rethink how to educate kids because we have to, because we aren't in the school building, are there places to begin kind of reimagining or reworking or opening up what we're doing so that we get a little bit more to the kind of work y'all are talking about? Mm -hmm. yeah, I think it forces, forces us as staff to reevaluate what learning looks like. And I think that that's a good thing. You know, because we have to. I think we're confined by different systems from the districts that will actually be counterproductive to that, uh, which is too bad because it, it forces us to, to reevaluate um, learning, how we communicate with students. Uh, you know, I, I, I called every single one of my seniors at the very beginning of this experience. And I told somebody I did that and a, and a teacher went, seriously, you called everybody? I said, how are you communicating with folks? They're like, well, I'm just waiting to see if they have any questions over email. What? 
right? I mean, it goes back to the inequities of access. You're just waiting on an email that never comes. And then your response is, well, I, I was available. No, you weren't, right? It's proactive versus reactive. Um, so I, I hope it forces us to reevaluate what learning looks like. I hope it forces us to reevaluate what true communication and relationship building look like. Uh, it has forced us to reevaluate technology. The district next year is going one-on-one -on -one with technology, one-to-one, -one, right? And I think we can do it because of a federal grant, but magically we can do it now. Why didn't we do it six years ago, right? I mean, I'm sure everybody's got good reasons for that, but it's proof of, to David's point earlier of what, what we can actually live with and what we can actually make happen with the signature of a pen. Uh, I think there's a lot of opportunity. I hope we don't uh, squander it in the name of sort of educational jargon and misadministration of the opportunity. Thank you. Um, all right, I'm gonna to turn to q and I'm also gonna take the host prerogative to say shout out to Jennifer Harrison of Moorhead Montessori Elementary, who was an amazing upper L teacher all the time, but especially this spring. Um, so the first question, I've had several of my friends mention that their very high achieving child went into some, something of a depression during this time because it affected their identity. Can you speak to that? Yeah, I, I saw it a lot in, in students, right? I mean, if you are sort of the quote unquote, and I hate this term, but if you're the quote unquote high flyer uh, in academic courses, you, you pride yourself on being that high flyer and exceeding expectations and, and being that student. And you can't, you can't perform at that level. When that becomes your identity, you can't physically perform at that level all of a sudden when, when grades close on March 13th, right? Who you are sort of disappears. I saw it in my students. I had a number of students, you know, to my point earlier of, of motivation, and uh, I appreciate Bethlehem's pushback on that, right? I mean, I, I, you know, I think being out of school and being away from the academic environment and having all of this going on around them, I think destroyed, um, destroyed some of that motivation, right? And so, uh, you know, I certainly saw it among students who um, sort of checked out because they couldn't, they couldn't manage everything that was going on around them with the news and with social media and with their environment and with school. Right? I, mean, I think it's one of the reasons the state decided to cut it at March 13th. Absolutely, I saw it on a regular basis. Yeah, I think there's a silver lining in that I noticed in the Duke students in some of the, the Zoom meetings I had, particularly with my first year seminar, that the students kept referring to this as kind of wasted time, a lost time, an unproductive time. Uh, they couldn't do the things they needed to, be, to do. And the silver lining was, in some ways, they were forced to sit still with themselves and sort of face the some of the ambiguities and discomfort in their life. And I think some positive things come out of that. So um, it's sort of a, when we define ourselves on our productivity, we sometimes lose sight of our, our sense of being. And all of a sudden, so I would ask them like, well, what kind of things are you doing? And they'd say, well, I help my mother by cooking the meal for my siblings, or um, I, went to the grocery store for my family or I took, my dad was tired so I took the dog on the walk. And I'd say, well, those sound like beautiful things. And then they would say, well, they weren't really productive things. And uh, it's, that's a function of the education system too. So there's a silver lining if we can sit still with ourselves for a moment and do some internal work. I think that there's something very demented about people that young worrying about product. I mean, I've been pushing back about against that language, even in the university setting for, for scholars, right? Where I wanna say like, why don't we think about this in terms of vitality rather than productivity? Yeah, I like that. Bethlehem. Okay, Bethlehem, I spoke over you. Oh no, you're good. Um, no, I just want to like, 
I think about the idea of productivity, not necessarily as something that academia pushes on us, but as a form of really intense internalized capitalism, where it's like, if we're not doing anything to get this particular outcome, then it's a waste of our time. But I think it's like, I think it was a point made earlier where um, for schools to change, the environment has to change. I think that was, uh, who was that? I don't know. But it was a really good point. I think that comes here too, um, in the sense that like academia is reflecting like what our society prioritizes and like we're engulfed in that every day. And that's just, that's internalized capitalism. That's all I have to say. Mm -hmm. um, this also, this question reminds me that like the question of what are schools for, what I've actually seen my children struggle with the most is like, school is their place of sociability, right? The, the family unit is an important formative space, but it is not at all the only one. And I think that there are times when it's not the most important one. And like, we are a loving, relatively functional family, which not everybody can say that, but even we with a relatively large house, like they're just tired of us. Yeah. So when they are blue and acting out and all of these things, it's because they need people who are not their parents or each other, their siblings, and they can't get that. And then the only other thing I'll say, and then I will go back to Q&A, is that on this question of like high, high flying or whatever you want to call it, the, the type A kids feeling depressed because they can't have the world tell them how remarkable they are, that I have this strong memory of getting to college and being very invested in people telling me how great I was and no longer being certain that I was the smartest person in the room. And my response was to spend a semester watching Family Feud when I should have been in class. And then at the end of that semester, I was like, you know what? I'm still the most awesome person I know. Yeah. And then I went back to going to class. But having some kind of moment when you find your worth and your value that is independent of that external feedback and to have that happen before you're figuring it out on your own and doing it with a wasted semester of family feud is a good, is a good and valuable thing. Um, I'm going to turn to a small question. What is the root of the inequitable and racist school system? Um, one question. Um, question. Definitely Short a, question. Take that one. Wait, is it me? Yeah, you want to take it? Um, I guess. I mean, the root of an inequitable school system. I mean, like, what else other than like white supremacy and anti-blackness? I mean, I feel like it's a very like cop out answer because I feel like you can use that answer for literally anything and it's correct, which well, is, actually is correct. <laughs> Yeah, it is the answer for many things. Yeah, and I think um, that's just kind of clear based on the outcomes that we've seen for like centuries. I mean, um, I don't really, I don't know, like what what is there to say? <laughs> I think I think that's my answer. If anyone else has anything to add? Yeah, I mean, to me, like schools really serve three functions. I mean, one is knowledge and skills so people can make a living when they become adult. But their primary function in many cases is to socialize and enculturate people into a system. And in some senses, make them compliant and obedient and to accept that system as reality, as a normal. And, but the third thing they do is they create some level of consciousness. And if that consciousness becomes critical enough, it turns on the system itself and begin, it's a paradox. The, the system has created a consciousness which then begins to understand that the system is socially constructed and molded and something else could be molded in place of it. And I think right now we're sort of at an inflection point where more people than we've ever seen are beginning to see that normal isn't really acceptable. And I think that has to do with the schools too. So there's another, there's another easy to answer question. Do you think school administrators have altered the original mission of school resource officers to, pro to providing security and policing? 
And do you think there's a role for a restorative justice position? And what does that look like? Um, so I think, I don't think the role of SROs were really altered in any way. I think, well, I think first of all, the actual like official role of SROs hasn't really been solidified in a lot of places. I think a lot of people have a lot of different answers including school administrators. I mean, if you ask some of them, it'll be like, oh, we need them to break up fights. And then, which teachers end up breaking up anyways. And then, um, and some other people will say, oh, we need them so our school doesn't get shot up. And that is also kind of an impractical answer because school resource officers are not trained to stop a school shooting. I mean, like they're really, there isn't very much evidence, little if none, that actually shows that a presence of an SRO will, save your school from um, a mass shooting but again that's a different topic but I think with um, restorative justice practices in schools I think that's an absolutely amazing fantastic great idea um, but as far as need to leave first right like I don't think there's anything that can be restorative if in the same space there's like an armed police officer like roaming the halls policing students because that's really what's happening right like they're not really protecting anyone from someone from the outside um they're just training admin and teachers to be scared of their students and i think that's what it comes down to and why i don't really see why we'd want students to go into a place where they know that they're being considered as a threat that like their existence in that space is criminal so i think that's something to think about um, when we talk about restorative justice, because anything, any sort of justice that's actually restorative or transformative does need to happen when the original system has been dismantled. And in this case, it's SROs. I don't think, I mean, Durham Public Schools loves them for some reason. I can't really speak to that, but um, I don't know. I don't know if there's any follow-ups to that. I'm sure there could be, but um, yeah. Uh -huh. I want to give um, Bethlehem a shout out for working to bring uh, Monique Morris to Duke campus um, last year and really change the conversation around and the language around, um, say, oftentimes we use words like dropout when really these are kids that are being pushed out. And the criminalization of things like dress codes and how they're enforced in such unequal ways. Bethlehem, you got something on that? Oh, about dress code at Jordan High School? I don't even think this is a perfect time to talk about that, but I still will because I have the opportunity. So I think like, as far as like my twins and I know like a lot of friends of mine, like like just existing as a human, as this in the school and like having administrators tell me that if I wear this again, then I'll have to go home. Even though there's other people in the same grade as me who look different than me a little bit, who won't like get stopped at all for obvious reasons. Like, I mean, I think like just dealing with that on a daily basis, like I know my mother let me wear this when I walked out the house, but suddenly it's a problem when I step into school for some like weird arbitrary reason. Well, it's not, it's, the reason is this because like they're hypersexualizing like black girls which is, I mean, a global phenomenon, but I think like a microcosm of it is in schools. So I think like, I don't know. I just think the culture of policing is like very, very strong. So like even getting rid of SROs isn't necessarily enough because like admin is so like, so committed to making sure that these rules that really just police people's bodies are so like, like strictly enforced. Um, I don't even remember what Dr. Long was originally asking. That was a whole other thing, but so, yeah. But it was from the heart. Um, I am going to ask this question, which says, for students who want to be pushed academically or choose to take AP or honors classes to do so, how is there a system that promotes equity, but also opportunity for students wanting to excel? excel? How do you create an environment that is conducive to students needing a slower pace and students who excel at a certain subject? I mean, my answer to that would be you, you train your teachers to fully understand two things. Um, one is differentiation. 
right? You train your teachers to, to have a better understanding of the different place where students are, to meet them there and to get them to excel w where they are and to demonstrate growth and that different students are doing that at different levels. Uh, I think the second is culturally responsive pedagogy. I think you have to change the narrative so that the, what you're teaching looks more like the students in the room, right? I think this is how um, you actually burn the schools. Down. I think if you want real reform, I think it's got to, you know, administrators leave every three years, right? I mean, we can criticize administrators all we want, but they leave every three years on average, three to four years, and a new principal comes in. I worked for 20 years at Jordan for nine different principals. So they come and go, right? And, and it's the, it's, so if you're going to sort of hold anybody to the fire, it would be the district, which I think we should hold to the fire. Uh, but then it's the teachers in the building who stay and are there and sort of creating a, a, a staff and a faculty that understand differentiation and that respect culturally relevant pedagogy. I think that's how you change the school. But you're not going to do that when 50% of your teachers leave after their third year of being in the public school classroom. You're not. So you got to keep them there before you can build that culture among your staff to then build it among your school. So we have time for one final question. And that question is, how do any of you imagine the students being part of the process of redefining or reworking how schooling and education is being done? I think that's a great question because I think there's really no such thing as like changing a system to make it benefit the students unless the students are the voices that are centered and like specifically black, brown, and LGBTQ plus students who are the, mo the most impacted by these really like unfair, well intentionally, intentionally problematic policies that like are in schools. So I think like their voices need to be centered and I think any other attempt at like positive development is, is illegitimate if their voices aren't the ones that are being heard and like um, their voices aren't the ones being considered primarily when trying to change things. Yeah, I think you have to actually talk to students, right? When you serve on committees and when you are on leadership teams and when you're doing a variety of, sort of elements of decision making and to, to Bethlehem's point, you know, it's just us old folks um, and we're not asking students what they need and what they want, we're missing it. We're missing something, right? We're, we're missing a voice. At the end of every year, and this is um, reactive, which was my big criticism earlier, but at the end of every year, we have a student focus group uh, of AP students so we can get some student perspective on the AP program so that we can change the AP program to better meet the needs of students. So often we don't actually talk to our students. We talk at our students and we don't talk with our students. And I think that's the biggest disservice that we do. I think it's all about our students and listening to their voices. I think just last weekend from Durham Public School students organized a march and they have ideas about ways we can reimagine schools that we need to listen to. I think the same thing's true at Duke, listening to our students there. I do love it when my students have ideas. Um, and yeah, and I think listening, I mean, the same is true across a range of everything. If, if what we were teaching people to do is to listen and think at the same time, but to listen before they jump in, in whatever topic we teach at whatever level, then we would be doing the Lord's work. Um, speaking of doing the Lord's work, thank you all both for this conversation and for your broader work in the world. Um, thank you for what you give back to this community and communities beyond this one. And thank you for coming and spending the evening with us. Um, thank all of y'all who I cannot see for being here. Thank you for a wonderful set of questions. I'm sorry that we couldn't get to more of them. 
We will be back, or I will be back next week to talk about living in a wounded world with Norman Bershka, which is really about environmental care and the environment more broadly. This conversation was recorded, and in the next few days, you should get an email from the Keenan Institute for Ethics with a link to the recording. Um, and I think for now, that's it. So thank you, everyone, and good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. <laughs>